Michael L. Hale started supporting independent tech news directly just now. Don't let Michael be the lone newbie. Become a DTNS member at patreon.com slash DTNS. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, July 11th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline's Grandma's House, I'm Sarah Lane. From the shores of Lake Merritt in Oakland, California, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, we have got a nice uh, summer bouquet of tech news for you today. There's there's some vulnerabilities. There's some speculation. Uh, there's some hope for, for future fears all packaged together for you. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Apple released an automatic update to Mac OS that removes Zoom's vulnerable local host web server, which remained on machines even after the Zoom client was uninstalled. Apple said that the move was done to protect users and won't affect functionality of Zoom on the platform. Clicking on Zoom links now will prompt users to approve opening the Zoom app rather than automatically doing it. Apple also disabled the walkie talkie app on Apple Watch, citing a security vulnerability that could let somebody listen to a user's iPhone without consent. The exploit came through Apple's vulnerability reporting panel. The company said there was no evidence the vulnerability was exploited in the wild. Walkie talkie app functionality will remain disabled until Apple rolls out a fix. For those following the whole will they, won't they move their stuff from China, the Economic Times reports that Apple has started exporting iPhones made by Wistron in India to Europe. Reports recently indicated that Apple has been considering moving 15 to 30 percent of its production outside of China, and India would be one of the more likely places. Microsoft plans to let users log into Windows 10 without using a password. Instead, you would use facial recognition, fingerprints, or a PIN. The bin would only be stored locally on a trusted platform module, making it harder to crack than a password stored remotely. The option will be available to businesses through Azure Active Directory as well. And the Financial Times reports data from media research that Amazon is gaining music service subscribers faster than Spotify or Apple. Amazon Music Unlimited's customer number jumped by 70% in the past year. That puts Amazon in the number three spot at 32 million subscribers. Behind Spotify, still number one with 100 million subscribers. And Apple Music in the number two spot at 50 million. Although, at this rate, Amazon could lap Apple Music if growth stays constant. Yeah, we'll see about that. It's, it's, it's easy to grow fast when you don't have much to go from. Let's see if they keep it up. All right, let's talk a little more about a different Amazon plan to help us in the future, Justin. Ah, uh, yes. Bezos smiles upon his children. Amazon announced uh, that it plans to spend $700 million to retrain 100,000 U.S. employees by 2025. That's about one third of its U.S. workforce. Retraining will be offered to employees in corporate offices, tech hubs, fulfillment centers, retail stores, and transportation network. The Wall Street Journal cited examples like fulfillment center workers trained as IT support and corporate office workers trained in software engineering, but also nursing and aircraft mechanics. Amazon says it's designing the retraining program around the needs in its own workforce, but Participation in the programs does not require that you stay working at Amazon. Its fastest growing job areas include data mapping specialists, data scientists, solution architects, and security engineers. Amazon has 200,000 job openings in the United States. 20, 20,000. 20,000. 20,000. It's a lot. It's a lot, but not that much. <laughs> Don't get uh, messed up. Well, let, let, let's walk through this. Uh, Amazon automating warehouses, uh, it's going to be horrible uh, for people kicking them out of jobs. Well, wait, Amazon's going to retrain those people who might suffer from automation for new jobs. Oh, of course, they're locking them into Amazon. Uh, well, Amazon's also training them for things that Amazon doesn't necessarily need, like nursing. Uh, oh, but they're going to make them stay at Amazon anyway. Well, no, they're not. I think this is a fairly well-designed program and the kind of thing that companies should do, especially when you're like, we've got all these job openings, we've got all these people, uh, we could make them qualify for these job openings. And it sounds like they're at least trying to do it in a responsible way. Yeah, you know, I, I, I wonder exactly uh, how much this is going to work. I, I, I would like to see uh, eventually where it goes, because right now, this is obviously the 
the great PR example to a problem that has begun but has yet to really reveal its true sinister face in automation and, and the unemployment and displacement that it will cause. Uh, but I don't know. Is is a warehouse worker uh, a tomorrow's data scientist or solutions architect? Well, well, it depends on what you're doing at Amazon, right? I mean, to 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 say, listen, we're plunking down seven hundred million, but you're not really going to see the you know the fruits of our labor until twenty twenty five. Kind of gets Amazon off the hook, but at the same time. Yeah, if you if there's workers that can be moved to other positions, and yeah, maybe potentially they would be good at some of these other jobs. Retraining is necessary. I mean, there, there's kind of no other way for the company to do it unless they just rehired a bunch of people. Or well, just hired other people. Who yeah, I mean, that, that would I mean. be... Yeah, like hired, yeah. hired new people. That would be the other way to do it, is just fire the people who don't qualify for jobs and, and replace them with Which people would, who do. And I think that, you know, it, even if it's front facing and not necessarily what the company mantra is a company does not want to be the company who does that you know no. if you're amazon you fire everybody and you hire more skilled people based on what your needs are in the future everyone's going to hate you also i mean they want to retrain 100,000 by 2025 it doesn't mean they're waiting until 2025 to train them it means that right. that by 2025 they hope to have finished retraining 100,000 right. some of them will happen before that this is good for morale when people feel like the company actually cares about helping you to make a transition. Uh, yeah, maybe not every warehouse worker wants to be a data scientist, but there's lots of options to choose from. And if you really go through it and you're like, no, I don't want to be tra retrained for any of that. Well, I'm, I don't know what else Amazon could do to help you. No, no, no. And, and I think that, again, they are trying to put a bow on something that they are going to be a part of, but they did not create. They did not create automation. They are just trying to take advantage of it as best they can, the same way that any company of that scale would look to take, uh, of, you know, make their product faster and more efficient and and stuff like that, which automation promises. The only question that I have is like, you know, literally is is the guy running the forklift like, ah, a solutions architect. That's my future. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe he is. If not, maybe he can become a nurse or an aircraft mechanic, right? Yeah. Like You'll know. never be a solutions architect. That's what my dad, <laughs> dad always said. I would never be a solutions no. architect. I'll show him. I <laughs> also feel like you know, I, I, you know, the the price keeps me from like going and getting another degree. You know, going back to school. The idea of being sure. retrained by a company that I'm already employed by to learn new skills that sounds great to me. But again, it totally depends on the person and what you're interested in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and also, uh, I, I, I can't remember it, it already fl flew by on the chat room, but, but one person pointed out that the things that aren't needed by Amazon that they're training for are things that Amazon needs from its clients. Uh, it's yeah. getting into healthcare. It, 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 it rents planes. So, you know, there's, there's some self-interest there as well. Thursday, France approved a 3% tax if a digital company has more than 750 million euros of revenue and makes sales of at least 25 million euros of that in France. So you have to make a certain amount of money and a certain percentage of it has to be in France. And then you get taxed. Uh, the new law targets companies that have French digital users, but few physical premises in the country, which makes it easier to shift tax burdens to lower tax nations. France has pushed for an EU wide rule like this, but it has been opposed by Ireland, Denmark, Sweden, and Finland. The BBC estimates about 30 companies in France will pay this. That it, They include Alphabet, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft, as well as some Chinese, German, Spanish, and British firms. Also affected would be French online advertising from Critio. U.S. Trade Representative Robert Leitzer said Wednesday after the passage that the U.S., or before the passage, that the U.S. will investigate whether this tax is discriminatory or unreasonable and burdens or restricts United States commerce. That kind of investigation has often been a precursor to slapping tariffs on countries. Uh, Austria, Britain, Spain, and Italy have also announced their plans for digital taxes. This is all countries trying to say, look, taxing based on where the employees are isn't very accurate in a world where the employees can just do a lot of their job and get customers over the internet. Yeah. I mean, as somebody who's, I, I'm, I'm doing my job remotely now, I'm not outside of the US, but I could be mm -hmm. uh, very easily. And yeah. Exactly. And 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 that's sort of the beauty of our line of work for the most part is that as long as you got the internet, you know, and you can be awake at a certain time, you're good to go. So so yeah, this 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 would factor in very much to to me if I was you know, I was planning on a moment of France.
Well, no, I mean, that's the thing, though, is that if you are not stationed in France and therefore uh, paying French taxes, then now if you make over a certain amount of money, what is it, 25 million euro, then uh, uh, you are now taxed on on uh, for beyond that basically you are right you know, but like yeah like but i'm not a french citizen to begin with so. yeah because french citizens are engaging with your product on the internet you are now being taxed for it if daily tech news show made 750 million euros and 25 million of that came from patrons in france we would fall under this law yeah mm -hmm. and now no matter what to put it after pay uh i will leave it up to the dear listeners to decide whether or not this is right or wrong I will only say it is the most French way to solve the fact that we're not getting money. We're not getting enough money from the internet. Or, 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 or because companies are, are taking advantage of, of the fact that they don't have to be in a country to do business there and then moving their people to a country like Ireland that has a lower tax rate. Uh, that's what they're trying to solve for. And also, what are, what are kind of the implications of this? Okay, let's say the tax rate was something crazy, right? This doesn't seem crazy right now, but let's say, oh man, I don't want majority of my listeners and viewers to be from France because then it's going to, you know, we're really going to get docked here on Daily Tech News Show. How does that change the way that marketing works for people like us who might? Yeah, good. That's a really good point. It could, it could have an effect on that sort of thing. If yeah. France stays the only one, if every country starts to do it, then that, that waters that down a little. Right, right. Tell us about the Twitter bots, Sarah. Oh, Tom, I'm glad you asked. Twitter bots commonly send out identical coordinated tweets in order to influence a large amount of followers. We have heard about this practice going on for several years now. The latest topic is a proposed smart city project in Toronto, Ontario. On Monday, journalist Sean Craig noticed that dozens of Twitter accounts were all linking to a press release using the same tweet language about a smart neighborhood that's been proposed by Sidewalk Labs. That's a subsidiary of Google's parent company, Alphabet. The press release was originally published on the Future of Privacy Forum. That's a nonprofit think tank that focuses on data privacy and has received funding from Google. John Verdi, the VP of policy for FPF and Sidewalk Labs, they say they didn't buy a botnet. That was not something that they did themselves. Notably, though, Verity noticed that many of the accounts use images, Twitter accounts, use images of people wearing sunglasses and says, hmm, this could point to photos being pulled from a neural network rather than photos of real people because getting the eyes right is hard if these aren't real people. Verity also thinks that the bots were probably part of a network being built to be sold or rented, and the Sidewalk Lab story was proof of concept more than it being a story that needed to be propagated across the internet. Fascinating. I guess you would need the AI generated image if you want to avoid being scanned and matched against a database of known clip art. Cause yeah. it's not, it's not yeah. hard to find a lot of pictures of people that you could just throw up there. Um, exactly. But yeah. yeah, if that gets you past a filter of some sort, yeah, maybe, maybe mm -hmm. that works. Uh, this smart. does seem to be some kind of test of a botnet because the press release that all of these Twitter accounts point to is fairly neutral about sidewalk labs. It's not, it doesn't seem to be an ax to grind kind of situation. So that, that sounds, sounds like a test to me. Also, I've seen, I mean, we've, we played games on the night attack podcast where we had to guess whether or not a photo was real or from a neural network. And like, it's amazing what you can do with eyes now these days. So I, I don't know if I totally buy the uh, uh, sunglasses thing. Although the idea of using a neural network is fascinating. This is a reality that we have to deal with. Right. Like the, the, the fact that these that these bot hordes are are out there, they are, you know, uh, man, I'll tell you what I would love. Uh, Twitter should just open this up as a marketplace, like just just bring it from the uh, uh, bring it from the black market to uh, the, the sunshine of the light and say, buy your botnet through us, Twitter, and we're going to get a 10 percent cut. Well, but the point is, usually the people wanting to do a botnet. Uh, are wanting to do something Twitter doesn't want them to do, right? They're 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 trying to influence something. Uh, they're trying to get around the advertising <laughs> uh, costs uh, of Twitter by running a botnet. So I, I don't know that Twitter wants botnets on its platform. Do, do they? Well, I mean, I mean they certainly I mean, like those I, user counts. As somebody who has yeah, they've been argued, they've been reducing that. somebody who has argued with a bot before on Twitter unknowingly i thought it was a real person but at the, it was a bot and it was pointed out to me and they were right i you know it can be difficult and it kind of reminds me of a recent story that we were talking about 
Google's initiative for kids and schools and parents be internet awesome, where it's like, we, you know, whether or not this is going to solve any issues, at least, especially at a younger age, being able to be like, Oh, I know what's going on here. I can I can see there's certain signals. I can tell by that bio. There's something about it. The way that we've all gotten used to understanding what spam emails look like. Then you know it's this is all kind of it's something that that we need to just understand more about, even if we don't understand exactly why the botnet was created. It's one of those situations where it's sad now that I I can't run the bots that I used to run perfectly innocently to just post things automatically for me. I have an account called at Tom Merritt that I used to just post anything that went up on TomMerritt.com to doesn't work anymore because you have to work harder to get around the, the bot limits and, and they've, they've ruined it for everyone. Yeah. Thanks a lot bots. Yeah. You should post you have your own bot network of a neural network generated Merritt family, just relatives of yours that don't just continuously every new day, a new relative. Yeah. According to my drivers, TF securities analyst Ming Chi Kuo, the report uh, he reports that the 2020 iPhone will use a smaller front-facing camera lens for the true depth face tracking system, resulting in a substantially smaller notch on the device and potentially uh, indicate a redesign for the model. The rear camera on the next iPhone will also reportedly feature a seven-piece lens system. Meanwhile, Business Times uh, reports that credit. So, uh, Tom, you're gonna have to help me on this one. Swiss, 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 Swiss. Or Swiss? <laughs> Just say Swiss. Credit Swiss says Apple suppliers are developing a <laughs> notchless screen, which may result in an underscreen true depth camera for Face ID, whole screen optics based Touch ID, or both by 2021. Yeah, I, I've seen some stories take this to mean that that Apple might get rid of Face ID uh, in favor of, of Touch ID again, if they could put Touch ID as whole screen optics. Uh, I don't see why they'd choose. If they could put Face ID underneath the screen as well, they, then what they would, very Apple thing to do would be like, we know some of you like Touch ID. We think Face ID is great, but we wanna give you the ability to use both and we yeah. got rid of the notch, aren't we the best? And you know what? They would be. If you bring back Touch ID, I will never stop buying your products. Face ID is something that I live with. It is tough, but I do it barely. Touch ID is 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 the better authenticator. Period. Period. Well, I I wholly disagree with you, and so do most people. But I get it. And this would this would this would end that debate, right? Right. Like we would, yeah. You know, yeah. We wouldn't it, have to let us all eat cake. Yeah. We'd yeah. be, we'd be fine. Well, and that's, and that's Apple's goal. Apple's goal is to make that unlock as magic as possible as like uh, seamless. They, they want you to have the experience of uh, as if you had no password at all. That's why they moved to face ID because you're always looking at your phone. Unless of course you have any kind of sunlight behind you in that case, face ID never works. But uh, if they had another factor that could seamlessly work together, then yeah, I think that'd yeah. be No, so, and Ming-Chi Kuo, by the way, if people don't recognize, has a great record with this sort of thing. Uh, so I believe in the idea of a smaller notch. I believe that iPhone is working or that Apple is working on the underscreen stuff. I'm a little more doubtful of Credit Suisse saying it's coming by 2021. That it might, it might be, uh, but... It, Apple waits until technology is really solid uh, before they put it in their phones. And it's not, by all accounts, not quite as solid as, as maybe you would expect Apple to want it to be to go into their hardware. A Google contractor gave Belgian public broadcaster VRT more than 1,000 audio clips collected from Google Home devices. 153 of the clips appear to be accidental recordings containing snippets of private phone calls, discussions of health and personal matters. So, this is a person contracted to review these to help improve Google Assistant. And amongst the snippets are ones that were accidental triggers that therefore include unintended uh, transcriptions. Now, Google told Wired that 0.2% of all recordings of voice interactions are transcribed to help improve the accuracy of voice recognitions, with the contractor saying he generally transcribes around 1,000 clips a week. Those could both be true. Google does a massive amount of data. Uh, and even with Google Home being one of their less popular products, I could see a thousand clips a week being 
less than 0.2% of all recordings of voice interactions. The contractor, however, said Google does not have clear guidelines for instances of reviewing audio of people in distress or potentially violent situations. Google's current privacy policy also does not mention using human workers to review clips. This is similar to the Amazon uh, Echo situation. That may violate transparency requirements of GDPR in Europe. Google has launched an investigation saying the contractor violated data security policies. So they're gonna to try to figure out how he was able to get these clips and give it to a broadcaster. Uh, hopefully they're also going to investigate whether their policies are up to speed because I don't think this has changed my opinion from the Amazon version of the same story, which is I think it's necessary for companies to have human review of some of this data in order to improve their services. And I think that's reasonable. You just need to disclose that it's happening and let people have a little bit of control over whether it happens to their transcriptions or not yeah uh uh yeah again uh, this is kind of running back the same story but uh i think you if you want to make this better if you want to have less frustrating experiences where your voice assistant doesn't know what you're talking to them uh, then this is the this is the way it happens like you just have to train the thing on 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 the voices and there has to be human curation of it uh, you know that said the idea that you might be, you know, working for a third party company and be like, oh, I'm hearing something that's disturbing or potentially harmful. And I, I, I should take appropriate steps. Yeah. Those need to be in place. There and needs I, to be you, a procedure you just, you just have right. to have that kind of thing. If you're a human curator of this sort of thing. Also, if you're not supposed to be able to pass along information, well, then Google has to figure out a way that, you know, if you're a human curator and you hear something that's potentially damaging, you know how to take the appropriate steps and you also don't pass it along to somebody in the media. Well, the reason that they won't allow someone to report this is they're not allowed to use the snippets for anything but training the AI. And that's because they haven't asked people for permission. So they're trying yeah. to skate through on a loophole. If they just said, look, Give us per you give us permission to use this for training. By the way, uh, if we uh, have this explicit permission and we discover uh, something, we may report it back. They could build that in. It's it's tricky though yeah. because a lot of people are going to say like, well, wait a minute. Like, yes, I wanted you to use it for training, but uh, this is a private matter, and I don't think it's your business. If there was an accidental of recording, I I I think that we are only now beginning to get to a point culturally where you can have that conversation with the end user and hope to sell these units because if you led with that then it would be oh really uh the, the spy bot nope get out of here well, <laughs> yeah because there's already enough of that kind of thought about these sort of things now, and it is, right? it is yeah. a very rare situation and a very rare occurrence but the scale of the amount of data collected means that it does exist and it does yeah. happen out there um yeah Got a little more Google news today. Google's Area 120 unit, lots of experimental stuff going on at 120, has made a new social network. If you haven't heard of it, it's called Shoelace. Users can pick interests and then connect with each other for various activities. Notably, if a user uses Shoelace, like if I have it but Tom doesn't, I can share activities with Tom even if he doesn't have Shoelace. So it's designed to, to be almost, almost a bit of an offline scenario where you don't have to have all the same connections on both sides. However, it is limited invitation only in New York City, at least for now. So and you you have to sign up with an interest, right? You yeah. can't you have yeah. to be vetted. You have to say, like, yeah, man, I'm way into pickleball. And then the pickleball people look at you and like, yeah, it does seem like Sarah's into pickleball. Bring her in. She's in the pickleball interest. And every time we have a pickleball event, uh, we'll make sure you know about it. Uh, and then the, the reason you can then share that with anybody, whether they have shoelace or not, is because all you're saying is, hey, the, the pickleball tournament is in Central Park this Friday if you're interested. Yeah. Tom, come on yeah. over. It, it feels much more to me like, OK, Google has had, uh, eh, well, you know, mi mi mixed results with social networking. This feels more like Nextdoor to me than it does. Google Plus, um, because Nextdoor is definitely based on where you live. It's less about interest, uh, you know, in the offset, but you can kind of use it that way. You know, I, I, for example, I'm, you know, my my local Nextdoor is almost all people talking about animals because that's just the kind of person that I am. And, you know, the fact that we live around each other is is, is secondary. So I, I can see where this would actually, this would actually be really great, especially because it's Google if you get enough people to sign up. Google services like this, I find, are always 
best when they are trying to solve a problem and not achieve a goal. And uh, I think Google Plus very clearly was, we need to achieve the goal of harvesting data when Facebook locks us out, right? And so they, they built the network to try and achieve that goal. Uh, but when they're solving problems like, hey, it it is painful to delete emails. So we'll have Gmail where you never delete an email again, right? Uh, uh, I think that they are they are often at their best. Uh, uh, you know, Maps is another great example. But this seems good. I mean, this seems like like it is at least in the strong suit of uh, of, of Google, and I look forward to using it before they cancel it in three years. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, there there is that aspect of it uh, whether people trust something to stick around. But again, this is risk free to try. Like, it's just going to point you to events around your interest. If you're like, I don't see why I would use this, it's because we haven't hit on the example of you're like, oh, but I do want to know when the you know Magic the Gathering tournaments are taking place. That would be cool, or whatever your interest is. If you yeah. ha if you don't want to ever leave the house, no, shoelace is not for you. <laughs> Get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes. Be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. And thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. Sometimes you talk about shoelaces, sometimes not. You can submit stories and vote on uh, others that you care about at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. Join our group if you haven't yet, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. Let's check out the mailbag. Got a real good one from Kick. Uh, Kick said, when you were talking about the potential issues that players of the existing uh, Lotro game might have with the new Amazon game, the real problem that I think was inferred, but not explicitly stated, is that of fracturing the player base. According to MMOPopulation.com, Lotro is the 26th largest game at 22,582 active players. Compared to the number two game, World of Warcraft, at 1.526 million players, Lotro is tiny. While, yes, yeah, some players might be upset that they're not getting the new content or the new location, the game can hardly sustain a loss of players. Assuming the previously mentioned numbers are accurate, the new Lotro game, maybe one content and better, graf uh, better graphics, or whatever the case may be, may draw players away from the old game to the new one. A loss of even 5,000 players could be a major setback, as that's almost 25% of the player base. So, at what point is Lotro no longer profitable? We could have a situation like City of Heroes, where another popular, though niche, game dies because the publisher or developer is no longer making enough money to run it. Unlike City of Heroes, it's too early to know whether private servers may pop up to keep Lotro alive. A quick search indicates, though, that private servers don't exist yet, and depending on how things go, they may never. Yeah, th this is a really good point. If you're someone who's like, I have no interest in this new game, I just want to keep playing Lotro forever, uh, and I'm worried that others don't feel the same way and will go to this new game, and the game I love might go away because of that. Get that. that that's totally fair. Um, that's also kind of the way the world works, though. Like Things become less popular, and other things become more popular, and sometimes things we love go away because we're on the other side of that. You should be like France and tax people for playing games <laughs> that aren't your favorite. <laughs> <laughs> right. Wait, is that yeah. actually an analogy or are you just taking a dig at yeah. France? Oh, I'm just kicking France. <laughs> Soccer blue. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we also got an email uh, from Jesse because we have been asking on Good Day Internet, the wider version of the show uh, available on twitch.tv slash Good Day Internet or to the patrons as an RSS audio feed uh, about uh, changes to our Patreon. Are there things you would like from our Patreon that would make you sign up or 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 keep you happy uh, or make you excited. Uh, Jesse suggested the following. I would love a video of your studio setups uh, for patrons. That'd be a cool perk uh, yep. to give people little yep. tours. Uh, and also for Good Day Internet, a mailbag segment on Good Day Internet, which would require us to actually plan a thing for Good Day Internet, but it's not a bad thing. It would. And uh, I, I actually, you know, even though I'm like, hmm, that's more work on our part. But I, I think that's a great idea because we do get a lot of GDI mailbags. They're not necessarily right for for DTNS, but uh, but they're but they're a thread that, you know, all of you that that listen or watch GDI regularly would get something out of. So 
good, good feedback. Keep yeah. it coming. Yeah. Keep the feedback coming. If you haven't heard us talk about it, uh, if you only listen to DTNS, uh, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Send us your ideas about what you would like in the tiers or if, or if there's something in the tiers right now that you're like, please never take that away. That's the thing I love the most. Let us know. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You know who else has good feedback? Justin Robert Young. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, besides uh, great feedback on DTNS, uh, where can folks keep up with the rest of your work? Oh, man. You know, I I, uh, I want to thank everybody because I know we have a large crossover audience and so many folks uh, from DTNS have supported my political endeavors at TakePoliticsSeriously.com, which is my Patreon where I do the newsletter and the podcasts and the YouTubes and the Instagram videos and everything. Uh, but I want to thank you guys because literally today we went over our previous high watermark for patrons. And, and that one, you know, uh, during the the midterms and uh, there were a bunch of other like I used to have other stuff on that Patreon that I sent split out. But now we are we are in uncharted water. So I want to thank everybody. Uh, if you've never given uh, the politics show a, a shot, then go ahead and download it. Uh, politics, politics, politics on the podcatcher of your choice. Listen, folks, it's really easy to get your name read on the show. If you're new to us on Patreon, sign up, patreon.com slash DTNS. Had to go back a couple of days uh, to be able to thank Michael L. Hale here. Why don't you join Michael L. Hale uh, and get a lot of uh, great membership benefits as well, patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Write us early and often. I'll be waiting. We're also live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Nicole Lee and Len Peralta. We'll be back to illustrate the show. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>